Second. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you. Um, any? can you cover any adjustments to the agenda? Yes, it looks like there are a lot more than there actually are. Anything that's highlighted in the agenda that you can uh, access on the school department website, uh, anything highlighted is something that has been actually added to the agenda. I did change the order to ensure that we took care of action items and were conscientious of our presenters at guest time. So I did change the order. Uh, you'll notice there are a number of things highlighted under action items. They were previously listed. I just didn't have all the votes listed out. So they, many of them have been listed for topics for the word action next to it. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, moving next to item three, public comment. Um, as a reminder, the public is able to comment. Um, we welcome that. Um, no more than uh, three minutes of comments per person, please, and um, should be pertinent to the items on the agenda. If you're interested in making a comment, please raise your digital hand and we will unmute you. Seeing none, let's continue with the rest of the agenda. Item four, presentation and discussion items. First up is Hopkins Academy field trip, and we have Susan Duncan here for that. Welcome, Susan. Hi, how's everybody tonight? Hello. So um, the eighth grade would like to get, start up a field trip again, um, this going to Boston. Um, we went to Boston years ago. And we had planned to go to Boston the year COVID hit, and we had to cancel the trip. So this is a slightly modified version of that original trip um, to Boston that year. Um, you can see for the itinerary, um, we're using first choice tours, which we've used for years and years and years um, to do trips to both Boston and New York City. I think they're also using this tour company to go to Washington, D.C. this year. It's the same company. Um, but we head to Boston. Um, they're going to do... Uh, the Science Museum for Math and Science, the Freedom Trail, the Charles Playhouse. Um, we're going to visit the Boston Tea Party Ship um, Museum. We're going to go on a duck tour. And then also one of the days we visit um, Faneuil Hall when we're doing the um, Freedom Trail to eat there. So um, the, the eighth grade team filled out um, like a little blurb for each of the things we're going to and the standards that um, the Massachusetts standards that are attached to that. Um, so we would like to go on this field trip, we, um, in, uh, May, May 22nd and 23rd. So it's after MCAS. It's the one thing they wanted is to do a trip after MCAS, um, before, uh, I think it's the week before graduation or after it might be the week of graduation. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, but they're really excited about starting this trip back up again. I know the kids themselves are, they don't know yet. We've kept it really hush hush just in case it couldn't happen. We didn't want to get their hopes up. But um, I know that they were great at Nature's Classroom last year. They were really great. And so they really are deserving of going on a field trip again this year. It's an overnight. Um, the thing I love about this tour company is that they provide security at night. Mm -hmm. So I really love that part of it in the hotel. Um it is, you know, everything's pricey, I think, in my boat. But um, we do start a fundraiser tomorrow with the seventh grade for Nature's Classroom. And we would like the eighth grade to join us in that fundraiser. Um, it's selling popcorn. Uh, they make 40% of the proceeds um, will go the individual cost of the trip. But the big thing is trying to make sure every student can go. We always stress that every student can go regardless of how much they can pay. We, we do ask they pay even if it's just ten dollars for each of the installments that will payment plan that will come up with after but if we need to do additional fundraising we'll talk about it as a team and uh come up with some additional fundraisers so does anybody have any questions for me or koki koki's on here also she's been helping me with the eighth grade team and running the meetings um so she's also with us tonight Great, thank you susan and thank you koki this is this sounds really exciting any questions for Susan or Koki at this time. Just, just to say, I really like how it's presented. I think you did all, y'all did a really good job of outlining that. Um, jealous that they get, get to see the Blue Man Group. That's pretty cool. Um, just sounds like you're packing in a lot in a couple of days. So yeah, looks great. As someone who's 
done this trip multiple times <laughs> <laughs> um, and started it way back when. It is phenomenal. And our kids have always been praised by the places we've gone to and even other schools for, you know, how well behaved and respectful they are. And it is, it is definitely something that they remember. It's a great way to end their junior high or middle school years um, because we, you know, we don't do any sort of ceremony type thing. So this is sort of their last hurrah together before kids go on to different high schools uh, if mm. they choose to go to Vogue or um, somewhere else. So I, I can tell you just from my own experience and with my own kids, it's phenomenal. Great. Thank you. I am. Um... I'm so glad that things are, are coming back to normal and that mm -hmm. we are able to reinstitute this Boston trip. Um, and thank you for bringing this to us. Um, I think overall you're hearing uh, support and I'd be willing to entertain a motion uh, to approve this field trip. I'd like to make a motion to approve the eighth grade field trip to Boston. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. Yeah, I do want to say, Susan, you always do a phenomenal job putting together packets and for field trips, you always do. Koki, thank you for stepping into a leadership role that we talked to when like asked you. So thank you so much. You always step up and help out always. So thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. This is all Susan though right now. Thanks. Um I did want to say we are having the school nurse come with us too for the trip for extra uh, care. Let me know about corn. <laughs> you know, I love that. I, I'm just curious, you know, it, Susan, Koki, you mentioned you have uh, fundraising targets. I'm just wondering if this is something that you don't hit those, you, can you come back to the school committee? Is that, a, is that appropriate for us to see if there's something we can do? Um, yes, I'm hoping that it's... Um, it all works out financially, like with the fundraising um, and the board of trustees gave us um, some money for transportation in, earlier in the year. Um, not So I'm hoping that it all works out and some kids, they were able, there was only a few kids that really needed help last year. So, and I know that as teachers, we also sell some popcorn, but that money goes into like just the kids that need it to the overall cost of it. Um, and we'll see where we are after this fundraiser. So um, we're just going to have them join the seventh grade so they don't have to do a lot of work um, with putting their own fundraiser together. They don't know about this. They're going to get surprised tomorrow um, that we're going to Boston and we're going to do this fundraiser. So hopefully, I think they'll step up. I know a lot of kids sold that did this fundraiser for Nature's Classroom and raised their entire amount of money. Nice. Um, and other, and families, actually this grade, particular grade, all grades, we have families that are willing to help. Um, so when I put out the fundraiser, I said, if they want to donate money towards a student that might need it, we've had parents do that in the past anonymously. They don't want to be known who they are. This is a great community who really wants to support the kids so everybody can take part in this and everybody can. We're going to make it happen for every student in the class right. so they can all go. Um, and I also, an important that they don't, we used to in the past make them fundraise, but I don't do that anymore because the kids, you know, they have enough on their plate if they financially can't pay for it. So I'm not going to make the kid fundraise. We're going to encourage it and encourage them to pay every time. But ultimately, we're going to make sure that they can go on the trip no matter what. Thank so. you for being sensitive to that. I really appreciate that posture. Um, mm -hmm. Some kids have the means, others don't. and uh, but But we want to provide the opportunity to all kids. So yep. thank you. All right. Thank you again for um, for this presentation. We're excited for the trip. Can't wait to hear about it. Great. Okay, Thank we're you. you're welcome. We're going to move on to item C. The uh, sorry, item B. Fiscal year twenty five preschool rates, and for that we have Miss Wenner. Welcome, Miss Wenner, and Annie. Yeah. So I will go ahead and screen share, and Miss Wenner, uh, you can take folks through it, and I'm Hi. happy to chime in if you'd like. So it should be pretty straightforward. Um, in the past, we've asked for an increase of one and a half percent. This year, we're asking for an increase of three percent. And looking at the numbers, it's 
really right on for many daycares in the area. Um, I was thinking back and I've been in the realm of daycare for the past decade, which feels really crazy to say. Um, but we are very, very competitive with our rates um, in those. And in our classrooms, we have some very highly qualified teachers. Fantastic program, I think. So um, I think it's very fair. Um, our rates, are, again, are very competitive with what's in the area. I think that we offer, in terms of looking at other area preschools, um, the flexibility of our schedule, the ability for families to have full days and a full week is something that you don't find at other um, area preschools. So I think that that makes us very attractive. And again, it's a very uh, fair price for families. So we would ask for that uh, increase for our program. And Great. specifically, thank you so much, Ms. Winter. Uh, should the school committee agree with that recommendation, you would want to uh, specifying your vote since both options are there, that it's which one? So the 3%, which is what we're recommending um, for next year. Okay. Um, great. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions or comments or thoughts from the school committee, particularly for anyone who might have preschool aged kids? I think Tara, does that, yes? Okay. Hear me? Yes. Um, I was having problems with my mic. So I, I think I, I, I'm i in agreement with the 3% increase. I think the program is extremely valuable and going to be three classrooms to see so much interest. And then, you know, the program brings a lot of students into the school where they find out what a warm and nurturing environment it is, and then they end up staying in Hadley um, for their elementary years. So I think it's vital, and I think a 3% increase is fair and very just. Very good. Thank you, Tara. Any other comments or questions about this? Seeing none, I'd be willing to entertain a motion to approve the 3% increase highlighted in a, uh, with, the, uh, with the blue header. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ms. Winner, for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate all you do. All right, moving on to item C, we have the MSBA update, changes to ARP program to launch in 2025. Annie. So I strongly encourage uh, the school committee, if you haven't already, and certainly anyone in the public, to take a look at Sarah Ross's blog post, page 12 on Daunted. Within that blog post, there is a specific link that is a uh, memo that went out at the Mass School Building Authority. The short of the memo is that they have put together a group right you now. You need to stop now. Oh, Christine, we can sorry. hear I'm you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right. I'm That's yelling okay. at my dog. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like, it was like pulling at me <laughs> under the that table. Was the that was the mom voice we heard. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was. I know. I, I stopped doing whatever I was doing. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it worked. I stopped doing it. Um, okay. So uh, they, they have pulled together a group to study the possibility of having a specific accelerated repair program for geothermal options. In terms of timeline, just what I want the school committee to be aware of, if the group ends up recommending this, the MSBA decides to move forward with it, that means that it would launch in January of 2025. We would probably be in a very good position to submit a competitive ARP accelerated repair program application at that time. The timeline for that, which means that the project would then become, if accepted, into the MSBA program and ultimately approved would become eligible for some MSBA reimbursement. Um, so if they launch in January of 2025, then the application will probably be due in April of 2025. They will review all applications and come out to do their due diligence, including site visits. So if we're invited in, they would come out in the fall of 2025. Important just to know then, it doesn't take us terribly off. We were looking to replace our existing systems in fiscal years 26, 27, and 28 over a three-year period. However, in this case, just know that if they were coming out in the fall of 2025, that means that 
we would not have this project on special town meeting warrant in October of 25, right? Because it would be unlikely that we would position ourselves to have a successful outcome if we weren't able to tell the public what reimbursement we could expect. However, if then we made it all the way through, we would look then at being on special town meeting warrant in October of 26. And depending on what work, work could start when, perhaps that means the earliest would be spring um, of 27, so in fiscal year 27, or summer, the start of 28. The timeline would, would delay our existing capital plan by potentially 12 to 18 months. However, the very good news is if MSBA proceeds with this project, this, op this funding opportunity, we would be saving the town money, which is sort of what we want to do. So I'm giving you that. And now Chris is going to talk to you about, that's just for your information, so you're aware, so you can have it in terms of timeline in your mind. And Chris will talk to you about designer selection for um, putting together the designs for this project, which will position us nicely should MSBA have funding. Great. I have a quick question before Chris begins, and that is, uh, I noticed that there's a $150,000, uh, sorry, $150 million budget, uh, annual budget. Do we have a sense for, um, uh, have you heard through the grapevine, how many will receive that? So what could the potential upper limit look like for uh, an MSBA support of our project? So how much is on the line, potentially? I don't but, know that. Uh, I don't. I, I don't believe they're talking about that yet because again, no, right now it's a study to even decide if they are going to launch this program. So I don't think they're there yet. I think right now they're simply deciding, are we even going to do this? Which would be to siphon off money from the roof boiler, AR, ARP, stop funding boilers and move it over here. So I don't have the answer to that, but I do have calls into the MSBA to try to keep us posted on how they Great. And then uh, our engineering study, when it gets commissioned and is completed, that'll give us some runway by which we can find out whether progress has been made towards that January mm -hmm. timeline and whether, in fact, we should uh, uh, push the time frame forward or stick with our existing time frame. So this is great potential were and, and very exciting news and, and supportive. Uh, so that's terrific. Thank you so much. Chris, tell us about um, the firms that have applied. Okay, so we had about a dozen firms uh, express interest in the project. And ultimately, we had four of them submit um, to the RFQ that we sent out. I want to just uh, make sure that everyone's aware this is an RFQ, so that's a request for qualifications. It's not a bid. So we don't go by prices when we select the vendor for this. We go by whichever vendor we feel is the best fit for us. Um, and so I sent out the four packages that we did receive. And then um, this afternoon, I was just going through them, making some notes, and I just shared those notes with everybody today. Um, just to kind of get my sense on, on you know, some items that I noticed in each of the packages. Um, we had a, a submission from CHA. That's a very large firm. Um, and the interesting thing about two of the firms, CHA and uh, Fitzmaier and Tochi, is that both of those also requested RFQs for the locker room project. Um, so that's, that's kind of a big deal because it would be great if the vendors um, – you know, it's a little bit challenging, and, and I'm sure they're aware of it as well, to design a heating system for a locker room that's going to be changed by the time we actually begin the heat project. So, you know, having both in one house might make it easier for them just to kind of coordinate between the two. We actually did today, the bid opening for the locker room, or the RFQ opening, excuse me, is on Thursday this week. Um, and today we already received one of them from Fitzmyer and Tucci, so... Um, we already got one submission uh, for the project. Um, the uh, the smallest company, Peterson Engineering, um, they're only 22 employees. So they're the smallest firm that I could see um, in this group. And um, they were the group that that 
asked the most questions. Um, certainly, I had more of a back and forth dialogue with them. Um, two of the uh, firms included a plan with their um, with their package. CHA, um, they called it an execution plan, and Creative, um, they called it a project approach. Both of those were were spectacular because they basically told us this is where we're going to focus. Um, when we meet with you, we're going to ask these questions. Uh, and it, it was really very helpful. Um, so I appreciated that from the two of those vendors. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think really in this case, some vendors were more, uh, at least with the experience that they showed us, were stronger in the area of geothermal heating. Um, CHA certainly had um, some information about geothermal that was very helpful. Um, creative also, I mean, the, they used to be Rise Engineering, so it, I think that was like something about Rhode Island. Um, I forgot the S now, I should have remembered, um, for energy. Uh, and so basically they were a company that was focused on energy efficiency. So, um, you know, basically they were the two that showed the most experience with that. Some of the others, when they included their projects um, that they had worked on, uh, had items like uh, apartment buildings and some of them had a, a retrofit from old mills to apartment buildings, which is kind of what we're looking at in terms of a retrofit in, in Hopkins. Um, but really, I, you know, I, I would have to say that it, any one of these could do the job. You know, it's really just uh, who we feel more comfortable with and who we feel has, has the most expertise uh, to really make this a seamless operation. I don't know if anybody had any thoughts or questions on each of the vendors. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. Not at all. Not at all. Please go ahead, Paul. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, can you describe exactly, just to make sure we're all clear, the RFQ process to what happens next and um, the scope of the RFQ process? So, sure. So, you know, the RFQ was sent out a couple of months ago, actually, in December. Um, and we, we did have a lot of interest in it. So that was nice. Um, I can tell you that... Uh, it's a challenging building to work on. Um, it's not the most energy efficient building, both in the heating system and just in the building in general. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them had uh, advice such as we need to replace the windows. Well, the windows were just replaced, you know, 14 years ago. Um, that's, that's probably not something that's going to happen, you know, so they're going to have to work around that. Um, and, I, I think a lot of the, the difficulties that they were seeing might be the reason why we got four submissions instead of more than that. But nevertheless, four is great because they're four quality candidates. Um, and so what what we need from you tonight is to select a vendor, and then I will contact them and go through the, the contracting process with them. And um, then they will begin work. It's it's a a lesser version of the designs that they will initially be working on. And um, that will be given to Eversource. They can use that um, for their TA study. And um, after that's all done and it's determined on if we want to go forward with the project or if we decide, hmm, you know, I mean, it looked great in the beginning, but now that we got a deeper dive into the, um, the project, the savings aren't quite what we expected. We can always cancel it at that point in time. So, um, you know, the two phase is nice because it won't, cost the full amount of money if we decide not to go forward with it. Um, but they will have the, the final construction documents and um, they will also oversee a lot of the construction work, not not necessarily the day to day, but, you know, as an architect would do, they come in, they check on the project, they make sure that, you know, we told you to use these materials and OK, I see you use them. Good job, you know, um, which we certainly need from a designer. Uh, I'm not an engineer. I can't determine whether or not they followed the plans to the letter or not. You know, so that's part of what they will be doing as as part of the contract. So uh, that will be helpful as well. And um, you know, we can kind of go forward from there. I guess um, none of them gave me a, a timeline as to how long the the actual um, initial design work would take. Um, but I'm assuming you know it's going to be a few months or so uh, to get that done. They have to do some test drilling. Uh, for test wells, they have to see how deep they have to go, I guess. And also, 
the makeup of the of the soil you know is it they go 10 feet down and they hit granite for the next 100 feet or or can they pretty much just go straight down and it's smooth sailing so they you know they need to know that and um you know all of that will be included in the process thanks russ i mean I'm looking through those the, today i just want to say thanks if anybody's listening i know it's a lot of work to put these bits together the, the responses so i appreciate everybody's response on it and i agree with you that for quality groups the things that stick out to me though just having you know going through what we're doing with the fields and your comment on the school i don't think this is easy and i think geothermal still to this scale right it's still it's gonna there are gonna be challenges with the site we have and the condition so i really keyed in on who's had has experience and and really of the four two of them don't don't mention geothermal really at all um one does but not so much in depth the, the one that really sticks out to me with significant geothermal experience is cha um so that's the one i keyed in on because they, they talk about the big projects they've done they really their execution plan outlines how they'll address the geothermal really get an understanding of the conditions um so i think we'll need somebody who's not learning on the project even though they might be an excellent engineer but has done geothermal at a large scale before and from what i can tell that was really cha I, I couldn't agree with you more that, that that level of experience is so vital for us to be successful. Um, Paul, which one was the other? Uh, you, you mentioned there were two. Um, was it yeah. the second the second one, Fitz, Fitzmeyer? And no, Fitzmeyer? it's the creative, the RISE submission I one. I see. Got it. I mentioned they had boiler replacement and they'd done some geothermal, but they don't dwell. They don't go into significant detail on it like CHA does. Got it. Very good. Thank you. Chris. I was just curious about um, the Peterson bid, only because they mentioned that they were going to be working with another, uh, the Ryzen, or Reason, I'm not quite sure, um, design associates, that they seem, what was, you know, that they're coordinating with them. I, I guess I'm not sure why, um, that was what that meant. So yeah, it sounds I mean, like. It, it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That was uh, well. Peterson is 22 employees, right? Right. Or That's and so I'm assuming they're bringing more on to handle yeah. this. Okay. Or would we, need more support. Chris, do you have any more context on that? It, I mean, the, that kind of partnering is pretty, pretty commonplace right. when a job is really big and they only have a certain skill set. Uh, but do you have additional context? No, that's exactly what I was going to say too. Is they're, they're they're by far the smallest firm that we have here, and it could just be one of those situations where it's either a, a bandwidth um, issue where they just don't have enough employees to you know to keep their current projects and take another one on of this size, or it could be more of an expertise issue where you know they don't they're they're not experts in geothermal, but they have this other firm that will work with them. You know, it could be either one of those, but um, yeah, pretty much um, exactly what Humara said. Small right. firm. And so it seems that this design firm does have experience. At least which with, which one? Um the one the company working working with Peterson. Oh, the the, the partner that they were hiring. I, yes. I'm not sure. I don't know that the I don't think their uh proposal included information about the partner, did it? No, Chris? Uh a little they bit. just basically listed their expertise. Um, they, you know, five years leading teams of engineers, uh, building envelope consultants, um, you know, assess buildings of all scales and sizes. Um, so I, I think they're, you know, more or less they're, they're experts with this in terms of, um, you know, the, the geothermal part of the project. And, um, you know, the, the whole mechanical part of it, they can do, but probably needed some assistance with that. Got it. I don't see reference to the the reason rising people in the bios towards the back. So really, just maybe in that introductory now, section. Yeah. I um want to say that I think you're spot on, Chris, about the locker room project and having a firm that does both uh, would be a tremendous asset. The, the locker room project is something that we are going to engage 
you know, sort of right away. I, I, I imagine that the learning that could come from working with the, with our old building uh, could really lend to the, the, that project. And, and just so that they're, uh, so we're not having to do anything redundantly having one vendor who tr truly understands both uh, would be very valuable. Yeah, I mean, as I explained to them when they were walking through the locker rooms, you know, look around and think where you're going to put the heating units that won't be affected when we basically tear these rooms apart and, and remodel them, you know. And so it's it's by no means easy, certainly, you know, for, for a company to say, I'm going to plan a design around something that doesn't exist yet, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that would certainly be a major help, you know, for them to just be able to, you, you know, I mean, I don't know if they're in the same building or, you know, but I mean, it's it's so much easier than reaching out to a different company altogether. And, that's for sure. I'm sorry. Could you just once again say which ones, which? Um, we received, um, CHA requested the RFQ, as did Fitzmaier and Tochi. Um, Fitzmaier submitted this afternoon. Great. Any other questions about... Uh, any of these vendors for Chris? I don't know that I have any questions, but I agree with Paul. Um, you know, the CHA is the one also that has a geothermal engineer on the leadership team. And I just quickly went through, I didn't see anybody else that had a geothermal engineer on their team either. To make sure I didn't miss the you know, I misspoke. So, um, and they did um, also ask for the RFQ for the locker room. So it sounds like they could com complete both. And I do think it's really important to have somebody who truly understands the process. Um, if it's new for a lot of companies and we're doing this at a school where the children are, I just, you know, that would be important for me. Great. Thank you. Any other final thoughts or questions on this? I'll, I'll jump in. I, I uh, kind of echo what everybody else said. I think CHA with their geothermal experiences is, is probably the leader in the clubhouse. I do, I do like that Fitzmaier and Gucci. I'm probably murdering that second name. Um, I do like their experience with um, schools and, and public schools to that extent. Obviously, um, that means they have a lot of experience working within this sector, and, and we know how challenging that can be. I think that's something to take into consideration. And, and that they submitted that RFQ today. But I think, I mean, yeah, I think as we've kind of said, CHA probably at this point brings the the most to the table. For that the, depth just of, picking, sorry, go ahead. No, for that depth of geothermal expertise. Because it's, it's yeah. great to have a lot of school expertise, but to lack geothermal expertise, that would really be, we'd be helping them learn on the job. And we really, we we can't afford that. We need a vendor that really knows what they're doing. Yeah. And, and and I would just say, like, that's probably true. I mean, maybe some of these other organizations have experience, but the fact that it's not shared in this is, I think, is important to take into consideration. Yeah. I, I'm with you, Ethan. I think if, if it were this just strictly on the um, locker room, that Fitzmaier and Tochi, very impressive list of schools they worked with. Um, yeah. All right. Well, it sounds like there's energy around CHA. Do we need to vote on this? Um, okay. I'm seeing yes from Annie. So uh, do I hear a motion to accept the CHA bid for the uh, MEP design? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Chris, for you. Uh, for shepherding this process. Um, okay, we are moving on to item E, award of transportation contract. That's also you, Chris. Yeah, I'm a busy guy tonight. Um, <laughs> so the school bus contract um, is up at the end of this year, this June. Um, we had a three-year contract with two years of extensions and Obviously, it was to our benefit to accept the two years of extension, so we did. Um, at this point in time, we went out to bid in December, had some interest in it, um, but 
unfortunately, well, not really unfortunately, because we've had great success with this vendor, um, but we only did receive one bid. I believe that's really because it's, I mean, there's there's three buses, you know, and the company that, that submitted the bid, Five Stars, who we've had in the past, they have a place already in the area to park their buses. Uh, you know, they have the whole um, support staff all set up and ready to go versus another company that would have to find some place to park their buses, you know, garage them, whatever in this area. That's an added cost and, you know, it might not be easy for them to do. And and I think ultimately they're looking at it and they're saying, boy, that's an awful lot of work to do for three buses, you know. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's one of those situations that it's really kind of tough for smaller districts, but I'd say we're pretty fortunate to have the relationship we do with Five Star. Uh, we do have a pretty strong relationship with them. And, um, you know, so the price really wasn't, um, wasn't that outrageous, uh, which was nice to see. Um, it was a sizable increase, but um, basically the way the buses are set up, we have the capacity to remove one of the routes from the bid. That's why it's only three buses. Last bid, they had four buses. Uh, but now one of our um, internal bus drivers is going to take one of their routes. And so we only had three. And so therefore the cost increase was only about $10,000 more than what we had been seeing in the past. So that's, you know, it, it's a $10,000 increase, but let's not forget there's one less bus, you know, so it, it was actually a pretty decent increase, but effect on the budget isn't so bad. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's definitely a plus. I did get a call this afternoon, actually, from another bus vendor that we use for uh, special education busing, you know, just to ask what we got for a bid and, um, you know, what the results were, which I, I was able to share that because it's public information. And um, so she just, you know, thanked me for the information and and said they were unable to bid this time, but you know maybe down the road they might consider it. So, um, you know it's it's just important to you know to keep building and maintaining relationships. I think that's that's the most important thing for us. And uh, five star, you know when he came and he hand delivered the bid, and uh, you know the two of us sat down and talked for quite a while. Just you know how's the how's the uh, the relationship going on both sides? You know it was a back and forth conversation, and and I know that Ann has a great um, relationship with uh, you know the people of five star as well so all of that really helps and we'll continue to you know to keep working on that as as we go along chris it says here it's a three-year term but there's an option it's a three-year term with the district options for years four and five okay well it's it's great to hear that it's just a ten thousand dollar increase i mean it, there there'll be a different cost of running the bus that we'll have internally outside of this contract of course but uh but the fact that we hadn't negotiated a new bus vendor you know, for three years and costs have increased the way they have this was a real unknown that could have uh, that that could have really impacted our budget and uh i'm i'm pleased to hear that it uh came in at this um any other questions for chris about this bus contract Okay, seeing none, do I hear a motion to accept the new five-star contract before you? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, excellent. Thank you, motion passes. Appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item F, school choice slots for School year 2024-2025, Annie. Uh, yes, so we're asking the school committee to accept the recommendation that you have in your packet for the number of choice seats in each grade. You can see those are delineated. Essentially, we're looking to have total grade sizes of between 45 and 50, just about in every single class, it's 50. In first grade, it's slightly less, but the transition from K to one, students transition at that point to higher student to staff ratios from kindergarten to a first grade. So that's how you see that slight difference there. These have been Great. reviewed by the principals and just looking for school committee uh, approval and you have to vote the slots every year before we can advertise. 
Annie, a quick question before uh, we deliberate on this. Um, has the max enrollment increased for any of the grades since previous years? Um, I think last year, gosh, that's a great question, Humera. We may have had a couple of grades that were slightly less than 50. Um, but I will say that one of the reasons I feel like both principals um, and Ms. Wachowicz, the SEL and MTSS coach, feel like we're, we're in a really good place to expand our grade capacity is because of the amount of uh, how much we invest in our systems of support at every grade. So I don't know exactly which ones I can't tell you, Mamera, but I do think that they are slightly higher in some of our grades, not at Hopkins. They pretty much always remain the same. Mm -hmm. Slightly higher for some of our elementary grades. We are in good shape. As I said, we just have that slight distinction that we made for the first grade. Great. Any questions or comments for Annie? Mm, looks good. Okay. Great. Thanks, Christine. All right, Annie. Um, well, so be, do I hear? Yeah, a motion to approve the school choice yes. classes presented would be sufficient. Do I hear a motion to approve the school choice uh, recommendations as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the next item in the agenda, we have item G, school calendar for the school year 2024-2025. Also, Annie. Yes, this time goes by very quickly, doesn't it? It's very straightforward. It's keeping in, in keeping with the contract. The president of the union for the contract has looked at them, done everything that we're required to do. For example, the start date uh, coincides with what's required in our contracts, um, that we have all of our end of quarter marking periods and everything else. So leadership team looked at it. The HEA president has reviewed it and now we're presenting it to you. Approval. Hey, any questions or comments from school committee members? Um, I have a question um, and that is about the um, half days and delayed starts. Um, this is something that we've been experimenting with for is it one year now or two years? This is our second year. Mm -hmm. The first year, it was delayed start at Hopkins Academy, early release of the elementary school. So the elementary school faculty that said that they would prefer not to, to do that. They also have uh, common planning time by grade level at the elementary mm -hmm. school. Um, but Hopkins Academy has really used the time well. Also, our educational support professionals are a part of the collaboration groups, the teacher collaboration groups and ESPs. They work together. They submit what they're going to be working on in their collaboration groups. So, for example, there's a collaboration group of a few um, education support professionals and some of our teachers, and they were really focused on ensuring that we were fostering a welcoming and warm environment newcomers and refugees and uh, have consequently put together a wonderful program that we're having this spring. So we would continue with these at Hopkins Academy, delayed start once a month. And apparently our Hopkins Academy students love it. One parent said to me, delayed start days, I think they were going to Disneyland. They're so happy to sleep in. So students like it and the faculty like it. Great. And um, so this will be, you mentioned that we've been doing it for two years and this, so we're, we'd be going into the third year now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons why we uh, proposed experimenting with this was to explore whether a delayed start at the high school level permanent across the board would be a wise thing to consider in light of the fact that the research points to better outcomes for students, um, high school students, um, and uh, we we established a task force. We studied it. We, we also simultaneously um, identified the need for collaboration time, and that's been uh, that's been accomplished as you just described uh, this last year quite well. Um, can you mention where we stand on the on the uh, permanent delayed opening task force 
study and whether this this coming year is um, sort of crucial to coming to a conclusion on that. Uh, any any anything you can share there? Yeah, thank you so much, Humara, for running that needle there and and uh, reminding me of that also. So we are going into uh, negotiations with both units, complete negotiations next year. One of the things we tested was not only the delayed start time was can we uh, transport on a single tier? If you recall, there were some folks who said, ah, how isn't that going to be awful? We really did not see, you know, as we expected, we, we didn't see issues when high schoolers and elementary schoolers were on the same bus together. So it is something that certainly we can with, uh, when we come to the table with the HEA next year to negotiate our contract, the new contract, which will be fiscal year 26, 27 and 28. Um, we can talk about the implications for the contract and, and other things. Um, yeah, and we know now that even though the elementary school didn't continue with it, we know that we were able to do single tier. We were able to do single tier safely. And so that's certainly the future. Great. Thank you, Annie. Christine. Um, well, I have two, two questions. Well, the first was um, graduation. Doesn't that seem awfully early? I thought the graduation was always the first Friday of June. So graduation, we just to make, need to make sure that they do not leave earlier than uh, 12 school days. We counted that from the last scheduled day, forget snow days. So it, it had happened that way, Christine, you're correct. Some of our students said, you know what, we're kind of, depending on where the last day of school falls, some of our seniors called foul. They said, we're getting ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> because because we are so close to the end. So um, we have, actually we have had, it, this isn't the first time, like this year graduation will be uh, May 31st. Um, again, the, the regularly scheduled last day of school had been, if we had pushed it out to June 7th, the first Friday, the seniors mm -hmm. would be graduating less than a week. And I understand their outrage, it was real. So we no, just, not, I, I just look at the last day and then we count legally when they're allowed to exit. Which is the okay. And then on the, um, the delayed start, what was the, I know there was some issues with the amount of time that um, like student athletes would have to be excused early and miss class because other school programs, their competition starts earlier. Does that make sense? That, it does. I yeah. think some of that has started to change, right? You know, Amherst, um, they they start later. There are other schools that start later. So again, when we go to the table next year, I also think you'll see that there are other schools, districts that have already started, um, move toward a, a later start. So it's less of an issue than it was previously. There is one school district that decided to start their high school earlier. West Springfield has been since earlier starting. They're starting high school at classes start at seven to ten. Oh wait, they um, went, that's really the anomaly. They're going earlier. Yeah, that's the anomaly. Most are are considering later. I tell you, having a son, a high school senior who starts later, uh, it's wonderful for many reasons. And I know there was concerns about impeding the ability to work or sports afterwards. So our family hasn't seen that. We have a multi-sport son, and it's it's fine. But I know that's just our it's just our situation. Oh no, I I would have been happy either way. I would have, you know, I'm sure my son would have loved it. Um, I just I'm just remembering what issues other people have brought up, and I was wondering if there had been any sort of uh, discussion about that. That's all, you know, especially. Also, Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just saying, like, especially for soccer and it getting dark and not having fields with lights and, you know, that kind of thing. That's all. Um, I can tell you that um, at least as it relates to basketball, my son has been uh, practicing with the varsity and junior varsity team and their practices begin at 3.30 uh, in the afternoon. So that is, you know, full sure. hour plus after. So, um 
it, it looks like things are changing on that front. And yeah, soccer is a good question. Um, I've, I've always, always wanted stadium lights on our Hadley fields. So I'm just going to plant that seed in <laughs> all of your minds right now. You just ask for an extra million, tell the neighbors. Yeah. No, no big problem. deal. Yeah. It's our next 10 year oh, capital please. plan. It's the <laughs> following 10 years. I have lots of Christmas lights. We can just string them up. Bad. That's, there you go. <laughs> That'll be beautiful. That'll be really magical <laughs> soccer, soccer games. It'll really bring down the temperature of those rowdy parents that come from mm-hmm. other towns, of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you. One, um, one question, and I'll be yes. really quick, I swear. Um, of Annie, could, when we, just to make a note, when we start thinking about negotiations next year, um, <laughs> it would just be interesting if we have um, past records of, say, prior to COVID, the use of uh, the school bus in the elementary school by students, um, the number of students that took the school bus prior to COVID versus the number of students that um, took the bus when we started this um, late um, start at the high school where we did that, um, you know, the one, the single tier busing on those certain days. I'm just curious to know, um, you know, did we have a, a, the lines, the amount of drop off and pick up that we have at the city of at the elementary school are there more parents that just drop off because it's easy and their kids take the bus home in the afternoon did we see a drop off during covid um, i mean kids just decided it's working out good you're not going to know that i'm just curious about the actual numbers where they fell did we see the drop off at covid or did we see the drop off at when we started the, the late start at high school just something yeah. to think about when we before we start negotiations just yeah. to see how it impacted. Those are good questions. Very good questions. Annie, can you bring that to a future meeting, please? Sure. Thank you. All right. We're going to move to the next item. Oh, we're not going to move to the next item. We're going to vote for the school calendar. Do I hear a motion to approve the school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Moving on to item H, revised JKAA restraint policy. Annie. Actually, these are both going to be Ethan. <laughs> yes. And this is uh, part of Desi's push, I believe, Annie, to get uh, some of these policies moved through very quickly. So we apologize for bringing this to you guys immediately. Um, you can see both the original restraint policy and the revised policy. Um I'm going to read some notes that thankfully Annie helped me out with. Um, The revised uh, restraint policy, the current policy is just one paragraph and per DESE policy must be updated to comply with current regulations. Um, And we're uh, requesting that the school committee approve this policy this evening um, requested by DESE. Yeah, and you, I didn't, I I just want to clarify the policy subcommittee was reading the current policy, which is only a paragraph. I didn't add, there were so many links. Oh, my apologies, here. my apologies. Um, yeah, but a big change. So in that one paragraph, it did not delineate or specify, for example, that one should never use restraint uh, on when it's medically contraindicated. So for a student that could obviously be really injured if they were placed in a prone restraint, uh, that wasn't in any MASC model policy beforehand. It specifies that um, seclusion and mechanical and chemical restraints are always prohibited. Um, so it's just, it's much more specific. And it is DESE's, their template of what they want to see. And then the attorney read it together. And, and, and thank goodness. For a first, I will say we are asking for a first. We did, did talk that it would be coming to you, but we are asking for a first. And final review this evening, we would like to submit this to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as soon as you get through. And I do have to mention that this was, uh, everything that is in the written policy is what faculty was instructed on at the beginning of every year, exactly what's in there in terms of um, not using restraint or when not to use restraint, um, all the rules and regulations around timeout. It just our policy did not reflect what was actually being done um, by the school. 
So this is just a more comprehensive and yeah. transparent look at how teachers are being told to handle this at the beginning of every single year we do restraint training. And uh, so it's always been there, just not in our pol- uh, printed out in our policies. That's all. That's good to know. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kind of exhaustive policy is, is necessary. I'm just all the different, uh, you know, case scenarios that they outline. Uh, it, it makes sense that we spell it out and, and there are schools out there, you know, not, not not Hadley, but definitely schools out there in our nation where uh, th- this is uh, it needs to be spelled out because there mm-hmm. are practices that uh, that are unconscionable. Um, but we um, thank you for giving us the heads up that this was coming. In fact, at the last meeting, we had you had already circulated these drafts. So while mm-hmm. this is first reading and approval, Technically, we already had the full month to review it. So thank you for that. Um, do I hear a motion to uh, approve? Can I just ask a quick, quick yes, question? Here? of course, of course. So, so, I just see the seclusion restraint, the timeout, and Chris, you just mentioned it. Is that considered physical restraint? So what this wants to, it's saying that- uh, It's not. You, you're not to it prohibits the teacher, seclusion, right? If the um, and so exists. they're very specific utilizations. If a student needs to go into a common space, right? They always need to be in a, a staff member always needs to have eyes on them. Uh, they cannot be secluded for undue periods of time. There have been districts that have received complaints because they've had students in seclusion rooms for an entire school day, not letting them out. Um, so yeah, it certainly is something that needs to be called out. And, and uh, it's one thing to have a calming space for students with uh, that we have resources there that students can use to help to calm them down if they need that. But you don't want to say to a student, into a dark room you go, we're shutting the door and you stay there by yourself. Okay, thanks. I sometimes need a calming space. So you have yes. a very nice one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other uh, questions about the uh, recommendation as well as the procedure, uh, the uh, JKAA underscore E report of physical restraint procedure and notice notification to pre- uh, principal? Any other questions on either of those? Okay. Seeing none, do I hear a motion to approve JKAA? And JKAA underscore E. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to item K, FY25 budget update. Annie. Yes. So One, the town administrator recommendations, I've included those for you. The town administrator is on the town side. I say town administrator recommendations because at the end of the day, the select board, I don't believe that the select board or finance committee has um, made, determined their final budget numbers. I think they're in the process of having multiple meetings to sort that out. We did submit a request for an increase of just, below 4%, I think it was 3.5 to local contribution, $290,000 roughly. And uh, we we were told that um, we should plan for closer to $145,000 increase in local contribution. So we cut essentially our request in half. You can see that our town is still extremely, always very supportive of its schools. You'll see that there were a number of part, uh, departments in the town administrator recommendations who asked for an amount that uh, has been reduced. The request was reduced. So that wasn't limited to the schools and certainly not because the town doesn't care deeply about its public services. It does. It demonstrates that with its investments. But the town received significant uh, ARPA funding, uh, recovery funding during COVID. That funding has come to an end So lots of towns have to make adjustments. So I just wanted to briefly 
walk uh, you through some of the changes that uh, we've made to, and I'll screen share that, that we've made to the FY25 recommended budget. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single thing here, just going to bring your, call your attention to changes. Um, what we added here, thank you, Chris, you see anything, there's an explanation for anything that changed uh, greater than 5% plus or minus. So green, it, it is, it went down, red, it went up. Most of those, most of those categories stayed the same, but I'm gonna bring you to this page. So what's highlighted is what have we changed since the last version of the budget you saw to this version. So we've eliminated in, the, in finance and business, we eliminated 22,000 the town had requested for upgrading an HR system on their side in their own budget cuts. I think that's fallen by the wayside. That was just our share of it. Paraprofessionals, includes a new wage scale for fiscal year 25. We will talk about that in executive session, but we're assuming that um, both the school committee and the HAA will pass that proposed wage scale. So that's included now. In transportation, uh, the budget's been adjusted to reflect the bid that you folks voted on this evening. Um, in utilities, Chris was able to lock in rates in some cases, so the budget now reflects that. Um, and in special education tuitions, we've had some changes from our last budget to this budget and some tuitions that we thought weren't going to continue, but um, in fact, they are. Something that I added, this is for the benefit of our finance committee in town, who also can access these documents and for a select board and for anyone in town. So we also added expenditure comparisons by object code. So where are the increases, where are the decreases when you looked at object codes? And this is across multiple functions. So professional salaries, and it tells you what's included in each one of these object codes teachers and principals and supervisors, librarians and counselors. You can see that the majority of the increases fall along people, salary lines, um, and we've seen a decrease in expenses associated with contracted services, supplies and materials, other expenses, and in tuitions. So we still did see a decrease in tuitions that includes vocational education and uh, special education. What's really changed on the revenue comparison um, is the increase. So previously we presented you something that had a local contribution of $290,000 roughly. So you see the local contribution has been decreased to roughly 144, 1441424. And we had to increase non-local revenues that would be school choice and grants. We spell out some of the ways in which we did that. We applied additional circuit breaker funding, additional IDEA funds, um, and we significantly increase the amount of money that we're recommending taking from school choice. You're wondering, goodness, how are we able to do that? There are some implications for this, but um, one of the reasons is that we had a couple of things, including the centralized system for HVAC and an energy recovery unit that we were going to use school choice funds for next year. Obviously that does not make sense, but we're still trying to sort out how we're going to move forward with updating HVAC entirely. However, it's important to know, there's nothing to be alarmed about, but you have kind of your, your guide, this policy reserve guide. And so when you look at um, how much money, you take all of our uh, grant funds, that we use and we include um, not every single competitive grant that I write, but ones that we are using to, to help with operational costs. You factor all those grants together, they're roughly second to last line, $370,000. Um, you can see in our calculations that we anticipate an ending balance in uh, at 63025 dollars of $265,000. That's where you see that red. Mm, you're not quite, you don't have in school choice reserves, according to this, you're not going to have at the end of fiscal year 25, that $370,000. Now, what's important to note with this is that our revenue projections are always extremely conservative in school choice. 
okay, what we do when we, when we project fiscal year 25 school choice revenue is we back out the senior class from fiscal year 24 and we multiply the remainder by the base amount of $5,000. We typically always collect more than that, right? We always collect more than that because usually we have additional students come in through school choice that replace those seniors who have left us. Um, and usually we make, we always make additional income on special ed increment that's impossible to project. So we always have the most conservative projection here. So there's two things I want people to hear. I want the school committee to not, um, which would be a rational, understandable response to look at that number in red and say, my goodness, have any and Chris completely lost their mind? We have not that we are in good shape and these are very conservative estimates. And I want the, the town to see that we certainly understand that the, the position that the town is in and they want to fund every department uh, as, as equitably and they wanna do, they wanna help out every single department. We understand that they're facing constraints. And so um, certainly we're willing uh, to balance our budget to utilize additional school choice funds. We allocate that which we had already allocated for some capital projects that we won't be doing next year. So that's a major change between the last version and this version. It would also be understandable for the school committee to say, hmm, um, there's recently a story in the paper about a neighboring district who's facing a huge financial cliff because of their reliance on school choice funding. And that has dried up so that it's dropped now, they have a third of the incoming school choice that they had years ago. I want you, you can see in this graph that fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 25, a significant increase in the amount of school choice money that we're using in the budget. Take you to this graphic. We're also making sure that those trend lines match. Okay? So right now we are at 124. Actually, I think it's higher than that even right now. So we've had additional students come in through school choice this year. So we want those trend lines to match. What, what our, uh, another district encountered is while their reliance on school choice continued to increase um, and their school choice incoming was decreasing, right? They were getting what I call that giant alligator mouth. That's a problem. I want these things to kind of track similarly, right? If one starts decreasing, then we have to say, okay, what are we doing? Um, we did update this chart. Uh, so what we've asked the town for in previous years um, and uh, how we've tried to also be responsive to the needs of the town um, and always try to have responsible requests. Um, I will just, none of the enrollment data changed. So I encourage the public town to review this document, but I'm not going to take us through it. We went through it last time. Certainly also look at that. Uh, recording on YouTube. I am just going to scroll down to the very end, so pardon my quick moves here. Um, and just a reminder, you know, I am, am always appreciative and I always want to call this out. The town of Hadley is extremely generous with all of its public services and it is extremely generous to its schools. We are aware of that and we appreciate it, which is one of the reasons that um, you see our position is always to cooperate, to work together with the town for the best outcomes across the board. We want all departments to be robust and healthy. And although the town does contribute more to the schools um, in excess of required net school spending, I would also say it's important to point out that since fiscal year 18, so the top graph on this page, that's the percentage of the total operating budget, the schools represent in each fiscal year. So it's gone from about 44% in FY23, it's 37%. The graph below it is FY22. So Hadley, that 38 is actually 37 in FY22 data because several of these other towns, a couple of them didn't have their uh, final numbers posted on the Division of Local Services. You can see that it's far more common for the school department in any town, um, it's, it's a labor intensive operation to represent 45 to over 
of the total operating budget for a town in Hadley. Um, in FY22 is 38%, uh, 37% in FY23. Um, so again, we appreciate the fact that the town does invest in its schools. And uh, also I want the town to be conscious of the fact that it's not, certainly the investment is not uh, an outlier in it really in, in any way. If anything, it's, it's, we represent a smaller percentage of the total town budget than you would see in most towns. We will have the public hearing of the budget next month. I just wanted to bring you, give you a status report of where we're at now. I imagine there'll be some changes between now and the public hearing. Thank you, Annie, for taking us through this. Um, it's we've we've gotten tremendous support from the town towards our schools and. Uh, it's really important that we uh, are great team players and um, and a request to fit a certain you know budget it w makes a lot of sense to um, to make happen and um, and definitely keep an eye on that school choice number that's been an important sort of uh, safety net for us and uh, you know, we, we are careful not to rely on that for our operating budget. We don't want to create any fiscal cliffs, as, as you point out. And uh, so thank you for keeping that in front of us and keeping us ahead of getting in the red there. Um, we'll revisit, of course, in the future. But, uh, but thank you for laying this all out. Comments or questions from any of my colleagues on the uh, next fiscal year budget. Okay. Thank you again, Annie. Moving on to uh, the item L, HPS district report card. So this is available on the district's website. I'll screen share again. I'm not going to take you through the entire report card. I informed families that this is available on the district website. It's also available on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's website. It is a useful source of data. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly give you an example of how we use some of these data. So for example, this question, what academic opportunities are available to our students? Uh, you can see that we're doing better in access to the arts than the state. But we really want to in this town and in our district to make sure that all students have access to high quality arts education. Just this year, all of our arts teachers, music and visual arts in Hadley Elementary and at Hopkins Academy, we received a grant this year that allowed them to participate in a professional learning community. They're using a rubric to assess the extent to which all students have access to high quality arts education experiences and the extent to which factors foster or inhibit access for certain groups of students. They're in the middle of that work right now because we'd love to see this number even higher. Great that we're higher than the state, but we want every child to have that. Access to digital literacy and computer science classes. Here you can see, oh gosh, our district, we don't look as good as the state and this is really important to us. So what are we doing about that? We are submitting, as you're aware, uh, we've been invited into the final phase and we have an interview. The team has an interview next week. Hopefully we'll be approved for two new innovation pathways. One is in computer information sciences, one in clean energy. I'll just remind the community that Hopkins Academy was one of six high schools in the entire Commonwealth that was invited to apply for the innovation pathway in clean energy. We also have submitted applications for Project Lead the Way. We have Project Lead the Way, which is about uh, computer science, digital literacy. We have that available in grades K through five. The school committee invested in a full-time STEAM teacher for Hadley Elementary. We're expanding Project Lead the Way into grades six through eight. Uh, if we are uh, awarded that grant, it will pay for excellent professional development for our middle school. We're also kind of changing our courses and our job description for one of our middle school math teachers. Starting next year, that will be 
math and a digital literacy computer science teacher. We'll be increasing our or expanding our courses in middle school to include uh, computer science innovators, app creators, and a design and modeling uh, course. Uh, in high school, we're also expanding our project Lead the Way. We're, we were just going to do middle school, but we're going to do seven through 12. So we've applied for a project Lead the Way computer science pathway that will provide professional development for our digital, digital literacy computer science teacher in computer science principles, essentials, and in cybersecurity. Um, and so we anticipate seeing an increase here, significant increase. That increase will be tied to advanced coursework completion. Again, we're outperforming the state, but we want that trend to go up, not down. And every course at the high school level that I just mentioned, so all of those computer science courses, every Project Lead the Way course is considered advanced coursework by DESE. And those students enroll in that, that drives those percentages up. Um, the last two, Grade nine course passing, this is great. This is what we wanna see. Uh, passing all courses in ninth grade is probably the outcome that is most closely correlated with graduating with a diploma in four years from high school. So that's a really important indicator. We're doing well there, we like to see that. And mass core completion is tightly correlated with post-secondary readiness and success as defined by degree completion in four years and first to second year persistence in post-secondary. People are, I encourage people to go and check out the district report card on the website. There's all kinds of data there. I just wanted to give you a snapshot of it. Thank you, Annie. This is excellent. Um, any thoughts or comments from my team on this? All right, very good. Thank you. Keep up the great work. This is uh, very, very positive. Moving on to item N, locker room update. Chris. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the opening for the RFQ for the locker room designer is going to be this Thursday. Um, hopefully we'll get you know more submissions than the one we got. Usually people wait until the morning of. Um, I did receive an email from the one that submitted today just asking if there were going to be any amendments to the RFQ because they were ready to make their copies and, and mail them out. And, and I said, yes, I'm going to make an amendment. You can email them in rather than mailing. Uh, it just makes it easier for everyone. And, um, you know, <laughs> when you're trying to get multiple bids, you want to make it as easy as possible for people. So um, I, I did the uh, amendment this morning, sent it out to all the people who requested the RFQ, which were probably... There were over a dozen, so um, you know we'll see how many we get. But um, regardless, uh, you know we at least have one. We know that. So I will. Um, what I'll do is probably the same uh, thing that I did for the past one for the DER. I will collect all of the submissions we get, and I'll send them out to you, and we can take care of that one at the next school committee meeting. Great, thank you. Can you take us to the next item, which are the business manager reports? Sure. So the first item we have is the expense report. Um, really not a lot to report here. Um, there's a couple of uh, items. There were um, just some errors in the links um, for some payroll accounts and items got posted to the wrong account. So um, there are a few items that you might say, oh my gosh, what happened to this account? Uh, for example, um, you know, we, we we go by Excel sheets that basically link the accounts and the entire elementary school teacher's account got posted to Ann's salary line. So uh, so she had a big week, the last payroll. Um, and so, you know, the total amount doesn't change. But nevertheless, um, you know, when I was reviewing that, I said, what happened here? And so I sat down today. Um, with the payroll person, and we made the correcting entries to to get them back out of there. He but, said, um, what happened here? And she still hasn't updated her wardrobe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, like I said, it doesn't affect the total at the bottom line, but, um, you know, just, just in case you saw anything that looked a little bit crazy, that's all. Um, there's really not a lot for me to discuss. Um, I will continue to uh, be doing transfers to grants. Uh, you know, a lot of times I like to spend them as quickly as possible, 
but you know we do have to kind of hold off and and not charge an entire year's worth to the grant in September or something. You know, it's it's not really the spirit of which they are um, intending the grants to be. So I kind of pace them out, and we'll you know we you can see that on the next report when I go over the grants. You know, any questions at all on the uh, the budget expenses? No questions for me. All right, great, thank you. Okay, and the next item is the revolving accounts report. Um, again, the the only thing to that I really wanted to bring up with the revolving accounts is that the January revenues were not posted for a number of the accounts, athletic revolving, which um, has a lot of gate receipts uh, for. So, you know, we'll see that go back up. Um, I guess in February as the deposits are made. Um, also, the preschool and the Hadley Kids account did not get their um, amounts deposited uh, yet by the town, at least when I ran this report last week. Um, school choice reflects uh, a little bit of a decrease, and that's because I did uh, transfer $300,000 of expenses from the general fund to school choice. Again, you know, we, we tried to... Uh, to spread them out throughout the year a little bit so we don't have this huge deficit. The next one won't be until June or even July now. Um, I, I, a lot of times I would actually you know, run the the school budget into a deficit um, and then, okay, well, don't worry, we have this much planned to go to school choice and I would do the transfer after. The town gets a little queasy with that. So, um, you know, I may end up doing it and understandably so, uh, I may end up doing it, uh, you know, once in June and then the final one in July just to take care of that. But um you know, again any questions with the revolving accounts at all no questions okay and the final report is the grants report uh, so i have made some additional uh transfers to the grant accounts but as you can see you know there's still a decent amount left to go um that esser three grant the the second one down the 119 grant um, so we we still have some more transfers to make, but the remainder of that grant will be used to pay for the um, DER design work. So, um, you know, we're very fortunate that we'll be able to utilize a, a good portion of this grant for that purpose. And I've already checked in with the state and they did approve it. All we need to do is amend the um, the grant budget and send it in and we'll be good to go with that. So that that's certainly helpful. Um, but, you know, even without that, you can see we have, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars left to spend in these grants. Some of them are transfers of expenses we've had in the local budget. Um, others are expenses that, you know, like for stipends or something that people get for, for doing grant work. Um, but those will all be spent by the end of June as well. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have with those. We truly are very lucky to be able to use that ESSER funding for this engineering study. That's Thank a you big for pointing deal. that out. Huge yeah. deal. Thank you. I will say I'm not going to be, I've become sort of uh, immune to being impressed by you all getting grants. So only when we get to a second page will I be. <laughs> I'm going to decrease the font size. To no, keep it you can't do that. No, no. <laughs> I can't keep track of how many grants this all is. It's, it's really amazing work. It's, it's, it's a lot, great. yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. We're going to keep us moving. Moving on to item P, donor recognition for HES playground project. Tara. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> excuse me. So the um, playground committee has been working to um, kind of get all its documents together on um, getting ready to send them out to solicit for donations for the elementary school programs. So this is one item that um, needs to be approved by school committee, given it would be providing recognition to donors. Um, so as per our school committee policy, it is approved by school committee. So as you can look, we have different levels of donations and then different things that um, we plan to provide during both different donation amounts. Um, so the more money you're able to donate, the more we're able to um, and incentivize. Um, in addition to this, I will be, you know, I'll talk with the AGS principal um, and ensuring that we have some form of media coverage or 
um, local newspaper coverage on this when we're at completion. Um, I don't know if you all had time to look at this. I know it was at the date. Um, most of it is really just, you know, ensuring that um, we send out thank you letters to all of our donors. Every donor that donates any amount of money, no matter how much it is, is going to get um, a thank you for, appreciate, you know, a letter of appreciation for any amount that they're able to spend. Um, and then as it goes up, um, you know, we intend to have, you know, a, an opening, an opening ceremony that the round is done and ensuring that we are able to recognize um, some of our donors, some of the higher levels. So um, after this, if, if it gets approved tonight, after this is done, um, we have a meeting this week so that we can start uh, formalizing who we are reaching out to. So at this point, we're looking for this to get approved, and then we're going to start solicitations for donations for the playground. And I'll talk a little bit more about the playground and some current points. Thank you, Tara. Any questions for Tara? Other than the overall target, but it sounds like you're going to get to that, Tara. Um, you know, we have high hopes. Um, but I think um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but um, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to get between that and there's a good chance. When we have one um, parent that's very, very helpful in nonprofit um, fundraising. So she's been spectacular in helping me, um, you know, and advising me on how we should go about this. So we do have a couple of things in our sleeve that we'll hold out for the end if we're not able to meet our goals. Great. It looks great. Yeah, the levels look very, really great. Thoughtful, all accomplishable, differentiated. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like the gold level gives a good amount of prestige and visibility. Um, this is this is a really well done, and so please thank you. Uh, thank yous to the parents and the parent in particular, the nonprofit parent who who helped with this. This is um, it, it looks it looks really solid. Thanks. Um, do we need to vote on this, Annie? Yes, please. Do I hear a motion to approve the elementary school playground donor recognitions? So moved. Thank you. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank Great. you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. All right. Um, item, the next item is the student representative updates. And as you can see, our students are not here. But while I, what I will say is that um, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, MASC, hosts a day on the hill every year. And this year it's May 6th. Um, and uh, students, our student reps are invited to attend. There's a whole contingent of other student reps that attends. And, you know, the whole point is to have them see just how valued their voice is. Um, and it provides a real experience for them. So please relay that to them, Annie. I hope that they're able to take advantage of that opportunity. Absolutely. Um, moving on to item, uh, the section five action items. Uh, we have already approved the field trip, the preschool rates, the DER project selection, transportation contract, school choice seats, school calendar, the two policies, JKAA and the procedure, donor recognition. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the school committee minutes for December 21st, 2023? and January 22nd, 2024. No, no. Do I hear a second? Yeah. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent, thank you. And you know and, what these next two will yes. go into executive at the end to return to open. You first vote this in executive and then you have to come back and vote it. So, Excellent. Excellent, thank you, Annie. Um, moving on to section six, school committee updates and general announcements. Uh, Tara, can you tell us about the playground, CES, and CPAC? 
Yeah, so we had a meeting in January for um, CES, and I sent out those documents, the annual highlights report and the executive director report. Um, that executive director report comes out with every meeting that we have with CES. Um, so that kind of highlights, again, just things that are going on at CES and what the director is to. Um, the annual highlights report is, as it stands, annual. It's a really nice packet. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, that really kind of highlights the importance of CES and the work that they do. Um, it's really quite a nice read. If you're if you're not familiar with what they've been up to, it's just kind of nice to read through it and see it. It doesn't take long at all. Some of the documents can go be long. That one's really quick to kind of pick through. It's great. It's, it's great. And it and it's it kind of highlights why it's great to be part of the CES as well. Um, so the second thing I'll go into just the CPAC. So we have a um a parent who has uh, resumed a um CPAC, and it's really in the beginning stages. So um this CPAC, for those who aren't aware, is the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, and so every school has to have a CPAC on that um, places um, advisements to the school and you can make suggestions, whatever. Um, and so this this group um, is a new group. Um, they've got new members um, and new board members. And I had attended their first two meetings. Um, and it was asked of me, um, and I did offer up to be kind of that middle person who is able to provide information um, from those meetings, the CP, what they're doing, what they're up to, anything that's going on, and provide that and communicate that to the school committee to keep them informed um, of what's kind of going on in the CP. Um so they, they, it's, it's great. We have a lot of parent involvement right now, so I hope it keeps up. And um, they're really in the beginning stages of their bylaws right now. Um, they've just kind of decided, uh, decided on their um, board members. And so at their next meeting, I will, you know, provide monthly reports on, on what they're up to. But that's kind of where they are right now. They're really in the beginning stages. Um, so next month, I'll have an update of kind of what they're planning on doing for the coming That's month. great news. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, and so the the last thing is the playground. Um, so um, the link that's attached there I shared, um, you don't need to do anything with it, but I just thought it was really, really endearing. So um, included in our packets that are going to go out to um, possible donors is um, this little collection of um, um, quotes from some of our students. I had asked Jen to to kind of get some uh, feedback from the students about what a new playground is. And so I kind of went through and highlighted a few of the students' responses, which were, um, we got a good chuckle out of some of them. Um, and so we're hoping that this kind of... Um, kind of melts you a little bit as you read it um, and, you know, helps donors understand why it's so important to our students, right, um, in the community as a whole. They're cute. So just to highlight, so we have just to kind of read this one, it's just so cute. Um, there's a fifth grade student who says, the <laughs> can't make this stuff up. Um, the playground is rusty, crusty, and musty. The slides have cracks in them and the tube slide is wiggly. Hadley needs a new playground because more people will go on it because it will be safe. The poles on the ground are too short, so fifth and sixth graders hurt their heads. More people can enjoy the playground if people will go. Um, so that just, it cracked me up with the use um, So that's going to be included in the pocket. Um, we've got a letter that's going to go out as well. We've got a list of um, donors that we plan on reaching out to, and we've also got a list of um grants that we're going to be dividing up and reaching out to um, thanks to the PTO is going to help serve as our nonprofit to help collect some of that money. So they've been fantastic. They submitted um, for the Steve Lewis Super Bowl um, and 
Um, unfortunately, that one does not get decided early enough. It gets decided in the fall. So it, it wouldn't be helpful in our current timeline, but um, they um, unsolicited offered to speak with police who just acquired CPS Subaru. That's how it goes. Um, and so they um, will be reaching out to police and seeing if there's anything that they can do for us um, in the meantime. So more to come on that. I'm really hoping that we can play with that. Um, and then um, the last thing that I'll mention, and Professor Annie can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so our playground, if nobody has visited it, basically besides Ethan, um, has some um, very decorative fashion tape. Um, it started out with one section, now it's two sections. And I was just on the playground today, um, and I, I can hear the kids yelling to their parents, hey, there's more right there. We can't go over here now. So I'm really proud of our students and not going underneath the caution tape and exploring the areas. They're being very respectful, um, at least after school. Um, but it has come to our attention that urgency, this is on the bigger picture background, the urgency is um, is is there to get that playground replaced and um, um, Jeff Mish is regularly monitoring that playground to ensure its safety. Um, so parents will be alerted and we'll do whatever costumes we need to take to ensure that the playground remains safe for students to use. Um, but that does push up our timeline. Um, the nice thing is that Chris has um, found out that there's already a list of approved vendors that we can um, avoid having to go out to get, which makes it much, much faster for us to be able to get the project up and running when we don't have to go out to bid. Um, so tomorrow I'm going to be meeting with um, the principal at the elementary school. We're just going to go through some things. Um, we want to make sure that we really um, are able to capture um, what students, staff, and parents um, are interested in seeing in the playground. So um, Jen and I are going to sit down, go through all that information, um, go through um, the list of vendors that we're able to use and provide some feedback to Chris and Amy so that we can hopefully start that process ASAP. Um, hence, the, the donor recognition is so important. We'll be able to collect those donations right away to help keep this project affordable as quickly as possible. And that's Great. It. Thank you, Tara. A very full, full update. Um, any questions or comments for Tara? No, just thanks for leading on that and the, the, being the CPAC representative, too. We definitely don't want a playground that is rusty, crusty, and musty. No, that is no, no, no. Math. not That's acceptable. My new favorite expression, by the way. <laughs> that was pretty good. Really, darling, those responses. Yeah, very cute. All right, thank you very much for that, Tara. Um, next up is finance, and I um, will just echo what uh, Annie shared earlier that we're in process in aligning our budget request to really meet with uh, the town's overall abilities. And um, so thank you for presenting that again tonight, Annie, and um, stay tuned um, uh, for our presentation next month at the March 25th school committee meeting, which will be our official legally required presentation of our um, next year's budget so uh that'll that'll formalize things great moving on to item c fields paul i know chris if you've got anything to, to, to chime in i know masta is starting back up given that the fields are dry and the weather's improving and um you have any specifics on that chris you want to share yeah, a lot of it was waiting for the ground to freeze so they wouldn't damage uh you know the existing ground by driving over it with the heavy trucks. We were fortunate really to get a small window of frozen ground where they were able to get a lot of work done. Uh, if you look at the weather this week, that ground won't be frozen again. So I'm very fortunate uh, fortunate that we got um, what we did accomplished. 
they did get the backstops up at both new fields. So the backstops are all up now. And I know they were working on it. I have to actually run out tomorrow and check. There was a giant drainage dip a ditch um, by the gym corner of the field. And I know, again, they were waiting for the ground to freeze, but I did see people working on it the other day. So I'm hoping that that's all filled in as well. And, um, you know, as soon as the weather allows us, we will jump right back on that. So it's, it's just good to get some work done while we weren't really expecting anything to happen. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thank you, both of you. Moving on to item D, negotiations. Christine Pip. So we will be discussing this in executive session. Is that correct, Annie? Um, and I, I should also say on capital. Sorry. You have a I was going to say, am I also supposed to comment yeah, on yeah. capital? Oh, okay. yes, please. Right. Uh, well, we have a meeting um, on Wednesday. So we'll see what happens. Terrific. Thank you. And um, onward to item E, policy. Ethan? Yeah, and, and thankfully, Annie wrote some notes for me right there, too. Um, today, we focused on uh, the the policies that we approved uh, earlier today, and we will bring back uh, the policy on our um, school committee public comment at the next meeting. Great. Thank you. Look forward to that. Okay. Um, we are ready to go into executive session. So um, the chair... We'll entertain a motion to enter executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares. And to uh, return to open session in order to take votes and report back out. Do I hear such a motion? And this needs to be a, actually a roll call vote. So, uh, Tara. I'm sorry, you need yes. your motion in your second. You need your motion in your second. You, oh. Somebody can so yes. what Humara just said. And so moved. Okay. And is there a second? Second. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. And right. now a roll call vote. Tara. Yes. Christine. Aye. Ethan. Yes. Aye. Paul. Yes. Humara, aye. Closed session where we just simply uh, discussed these two items. Uh, the first, uh, do I have a motion to approve the memorandum, memorandum of understanding for Unit A as it relates to the middle school and high school schedule change? So moved. Second. And, okay. And uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the memorandum of understanding for unit D for uh, the new scale. Do I hear a motion to approve that as presented? So moved. Seconded. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes uh, unanimously. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, let me just look at my notes here. Um, we are going to be meeting again on March 25th at 5.30 for our regular school committee meeting. There will be a policy meeting a half hour before that. Is that true? Yes, very good. And um, thanks so much. It's uh, It was a, a little bit of a lengthier meeting, but I appreciate you all sticking with this and thank you for your time. We'll have see you again. Again. Thank you all. Have a good night. Do you want to move to adjourn? Does somebody want to? I'm sure. Oh, we should we'll probably do that. that. <laughs> do I hear a motion encourage, to adjourn? Just encourage folks tomorrow night. The boys basketball team's playing South Shore at 5.30 and the girls are playing yes. the academy at 7. So yes. we'll out and oh, good to know. Yeah. We canceled our third and fourth grade practice until they all had to go to the game. There you go. Should be a good one. Yeah. Thank you, Paul, for that. All right. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah.